Congressman. Um, and uh, thank you, Congressman Raskin and the Democratic members of the roundtable. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to appear before you to discuss my experiences in the ongoing protests in Portland, Oregon. Uh, my name is Mark Pettibone. I'm an essential worker, uh, a recent graduate student at Reed College here in Portland, and more pertinent to the issue at hand, a nonviolent protester for Black Lives Matter in the wake of the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, and so many more unnamed Black and Indigenous people at the hands of local and federal law enforcement. Uh, I'm speaking with you today because I want to share my experiences and shed light on the authoritarian tactics by federal government officials that further jeopardize the very fabric of our democracy. Uh, on Tuesday, July 14th, I attended a protest in front of the Multnomah County Justice Center and Marco Hatfield Federal Courthouse in downtown Portland. Uh, it started as an uneventful night in terms of interactions between protesters and police forces. Uh, I listened to Black Lives Matter speakers, chanted about justice, uh, made some new friends playing Frisbee in the park. Um, both federal and Portland Police Bureau officers made brief appearances throughout the night, but each quickly retreated into their respective buildings without further escalation. At around 2 o'clock a.m. on July 15th, my friend and I decided to head home. As we walked west towards our vehicle, a small group of protesters stopped us at the corner of Southwest 5th Avenue and Main Street blocks away from any federal property. They warned us that unmarked vans had been seen patrolling the perimeter of the area with men jumping out, snatching protesters who had strayed from the larger group of, of protests at the park. Uh, the whole idea seemed incredible to me, but sure enough, within seconds of this conversation, an unmarked, an unmarked dark colored minivan pulled up directly in front of us and four or five uh, people wearing military fatigues jumped out. Uh, I was shocked and afraid for my life and fled west on Main Street while one of the people from the van pursued me on foot. As I turned the corner on Broadway, a van cut me off and realizing I couldn't escape, I dropped to my knees asking why several times. Nobody gave me an explanation. They didn't tell me who they were with or why I was being detained. They simply forced me into the back of the van. Once I was inside the van, someone grabbed my hands and clutched them together above my head with one hand using the arm of the same hand to put pressure on my head and neck to keep it down. The same person, or at least I believe it was the same person, used his or her other hand to pull my beanie over my eyes and to pat me down. The person asked if I had any weapons on me and I said no. We were then driving and someone in the van told another person to turn their communications radio down so I couldn't hear the information being communicated, even though I was too fearful and distracted to be paying attention. Uh, the individuals in the van drove me to what I would later find out was the federal courthouse. Uh, they led me to a wall inside of a larger garage where they took my picture on a cell phone. One officer asked if they should remove my backpack, to which another responded, quote, no, let them see him with all this, unquote. I was escorted up an elevator to a floor containing multiple cells. Uh, I faced another wall while officials took my belongings, dumped out the contents of my backpack, cuffed my hands, and shackled my ankles. Someone asked if I should have a COVID mask. Uh, the officer patting me down declined, commenting that I would receive one later. Upon seeing the contents of my backpack, one officer remarked, quote, this is a whole lot of nothing, unquote. Another said, quote, at least we know his hands are clean, unquote, apparently referring to the two bottles of hand sanitizer I had in my bag to offer people at the protest to combat, to combat COVID-19. Uh, one officer also made a point to gesture to another officer that I had an inhaler in my bag. I was then placed in a cell by myself. Uh, two officers later approached my cell, mentioning their names, but to the best of my recollection, not identifying the agency they worked for. They said they were about to read me my rights and that they'd record the audio. After reading me my rights, they asked if I wanted to waive them to answer some questions. I declined and asked for a lawyer. To which they responded, this interview is now terminated, and they promptly left. Uh, another person came by to ask if I had any illnesses, and I said, yes, I have asthma, and I'd like my inhaler. Uh, they brought me my inhaler, my glasses, uh, shoes without the laces, socks, and a paper mask. Uh, after that, I simply waited. At one point, another person was brought into a different cell down the corridor from me. This other detainee and I were eventually released with no documentation or any record of our arrests. Uh, I was given my backpack in a garbage bag. When I checked for my cell phone and wallet, I noticed that my respirator had been snapped and broken. Uh, 
Uh, I was released in the early morning hours out of the north side of the federal courthouse, at which point I finally understood where, to, where I'd been um, and who had taken me. Uh, I called a friend to pick me up, and as we drove away, uh, federal officers started to gas the entire block where protesters were still demonstrating. I still couldn't believe what was happening. Uh, I've returned to protests only twice since the night of my arrest. I would like to go more often, but I'm fearful of being targeted by police or those seeking vigilante justice um, now that I'm a known party. All in all, what I've lived through was a terrible experience. But I want to make one thing absolutely clear. Uh, what happened to me occurred over a period of hours, even if it felt like days. It traumatized me in ways that I'm still processing, but I can't begin to fathom how it must feel for people of color who have suffered 400 years of having their rights violated in this country, generation after generation. I'm so grateful to witness the resilience and strength of the Black human spirit here in Portland, particularly among those putting in the work on the ground for this movement. Uh, that's what give me, gives me hope for this country. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak here today. And I urge you in the strongest possible way to investigate the flagrant disregard for civil rights and civil liberties inflicted on the citizens of my proud and wonderful city, Portland, Oregon. Thank you very much, Mr. Pettibone, for your excellent testimony. And now, Ms. Simon, you're recognized for your five minutes. Congressman Raskin, Congresswoman Maloney, Members of Congress, on behalf of the American Civil Liberties Union of Oregon and the ACLU's national office, and it's more than 8 million members, activists, and supporters throughout the country, thank you for inviting me to participate in today's roundtable. My name is Kelly Simon. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the interim legal director at the ACLU of Oregon. If you hear nothing else from me today, hear this. Black lives matter. While the nation's attention has been fixed on Portland, police throughout the country and at all levels of government have been shamefully engaged in a concerted attack on the right to dissent, meeting the calls to end racist police brutality with more police brutality. The federal government is adding escalation on top of this escalation. In my role at ACLU of Oregon, what I have been bearing witness to is nothing short of an unconstitutional nightmare. But putting the legalities of this lawlessness aside for just a moment, what we are seeing is also terrifying. We are seeing crowds of people lawfully exercising their First Amendment rights to demand an end to police brutality and racist policing, being met with clouds of tear gas and other chemical weapons. We are seeing those same people shot directly in the head causing skull fractures and shot repeatedly in the back, causing large and painful contusions. Those that dare to bear witness are also being shot, pushed and gassed, threatening to suppress the truth about these abuses. People are being drugged into unmarked vehicles, swept off the streets with no explanation. It is chilling. These tactics, anonymous policing, disappearing people through violence or snatch and grab tactics, shows a force. These are tactics we have seen federal law enforcement use to intimidate, control, and devalue the lives of black, brown, and indigenous communities. For example, the ACLU of Oregon has filed a complaint on behalf of an Oregonian in Representative Bonamici's district, uh, Isidro Andrade Tafoya, who came out of a county courthouse where he was accompanying his wife, only to be surrounded by immigration and customs enforcement officers in unmarked vehicles and plain clothes. The ICE officers accused Mr. Andrade Tafoya of being a person they suspected was in the country without lawful status. The only similarity between Mr. Andrade Tafoya and that person was the color, was the color of his skin, brown. In the name of national security, these DHS agencies, along with the U.S. Marshals Service, are terrorizing Oregonians and promising to raise the specter of their militarized violence and intimidation nationwide. These police tactics have no place in a free society and fly in the face of our country's founding constitutional principles. Freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of the press, the right to petition our government for redress of grievances, of due process, of a presumption of innocence, of prohibiting unreasonable searches and seizures, of power held by we the people. 
The ACLU has responded with several lawsuits nationwide, including cases in Oregon, seeking to prohibit the dispersal and use of force against journalists, legal observers, and medics providing aid to injured protesters. And we will continue to defend the rights of protesters in Oregon and beyond against the onslaught of attacks we are seeing. There are two injuries that continue to stick with me. First, while rendering aid to police wounded protesters, a medic clearly marked with a red cross was shot in the chest with a tear gas canister. Second, while wearing a bright green National Lawyers Guild legal observer hat and documenting activity in downtown Portland, a federal officer shot a person in the heart with a 40 millimeter impact munition. The second attack was shortly after a district court judge issued a temporary restraining order prohibiting federal law enforcement officers from targeting journalists and legal observers, including legal observers in green NLG hats. Where police wear badges, these community members wear severe bruises. These injuries stick with me because they make clear the threat. What is under attack in this country is the heart of our democracy. Congress must intervene to rein in these abuses with the following actions. And I've provided a little bit more detail in written testimony to you all. But Congress must take these following actions. Congress must urge the Department of Justice to appoint a special counsel to investigate criminal violations of constitutional rights. Congress must compel DOJ to produce the MOUs or any other agreements between federal agents and local law enforcement in Portland and elsewhere. And Congress must rein in the tools and tactics used by federal agents to commit civil rights violations, including prohibiting the indiscriminate use of less, less lethal, so-called less lethal weapons and requiring federal agents to be identifiable. And finally, I'd like to urge everyone who makes up We the People to engage this national conversation and to take action to ensure that the lawlessness of this administration ends. Call your government leaders, hold them accountable to reigning in these abuses. Thank you. Ms. Simon, thank you for your excellent statement uh, to the round table. We are very much appreciated. And I'm calling now on Christopher David. You are recognized for five minutes for your statement. Congressman Raskin and Democratic members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to be here for to be before you today to discuss my experience in the ongoing protests in Portland, Oregon. My name is Chris David. What I witnessed when I attended the protests was a shocking attack by our own government on peaceful citizens expressing their support for Black Lives Matter and police reform. I have to mention at the outset that my experience of these events is permanently shaped by my service in the United States Navy. 36 years ago, I walked through the gates of the United States Naval Academy as a scared 17-year-old high school graduate from Lakewood, Colorado. I grew up in the western part of the United States. The East Coast was a mystery to me. It actually still is. Everything looked old, green, and full of wisdom. How could I fit into a such a place as this? It turns out that most of us entering the Naval Academy felt that way, no matter where we came from across this great land. But the Academy became our unifying experience, the forge that heated and hammered us into one unit with the same goal and purpose, to support and defend the Constitution of the United States from all enemies, foreign and domestic. And that is why I'm sitting here with you today the testimony and experiences that I share today are mine and mine alone. I do not speak for the Naval Academy or my fellow vets. I speak for myself. I had always believed that when taking the oath of office, everyone else believed as we did when we took ours. That was my hope, my lodestar. That's how the United States continued to strive and make itself better. But I was wrong, very wrong. Having watched the early days of July, turn what were predominantly peaceful protests into violence in a small area in downtown Portland, I came to understand that for some people, the oath is just a set of words, not a calling. I watched on TV as federal officers in unmarked uniforms arbitrarily abduct US citizens from the streets of Portland and shove them into rented minivans. I was shocked and appalled. If the US government could do this to our fellow citizens, where would it end? Anybody can buy surplus military uniforms and rent a minivan. 
How do we know that these really are the feds when it happens again? What if it's really the Proud Boys or the Boogaloos? This was a slippery slope with massive implications for all of our freedoms, not just freedom of speech. My decision to attend the protest was a spontaneous one, and I had almost gone <clears throat> down the previous night. I regret not doing so since I missed a spectacular display of naked defiance and raw courage, courage that I myself do not possess. When I got down to the area of the protest, I stood by the building next door to the federal courthouse and listened to a group of physicians from the Oregon Health Sciences University talk about the serious harm that federal officers were acting upon their fellow citizens, the broken bones, the fried lungs, the damaged heads and brains. This was not Portland. This was not the United States I had sworn to defend. I walked the perimeter of the protests and was shocked to see how small the affected area actually was. Four square city blocks. That was it. From what the administration had been telling us, all of downtown Portland was in flames with uncontrolled and widespread looting everywhere. Nope, just four square city blocks. It was also peaceful when I arrived, with more the air of a festival and people excited by their cause than the violence or looting depicted by the administration. Only later at night did the mood change, as people anticipated the arrival of the federal officers like a violent and gassy wind. Everybody knew it was going to arrive, just not exactly when or where from. When the federal officers emerged from the courthouse, I saw them rush at the protesters in the Southwest intersection, plowing into them and knocking them down. I watched this happen in shock. I then stepped out of the park and into the street just north of the intersection and stood there just several feet from the curve. When the federal officers were done dispatching the peaceful protesters in the intersection, they turned their attention toward me the first one leveled his weapon at me as he approached, then lowered it. The second officer then plowed into me, knocking, knocking me back several feet. I then squared up, stood my ground, still stunned by what was happening. A much smaller officer then proceeded to hit me with a baton five times as other officers sprayed a chemical irritant into my face from a very short range. Blinded and with a broken hand, I offered the officers a disgusted farewell salute and then started back toward the park and into a giant cloud of tear gas. Stumbling and blinded, I was rescued by a volunteer street medic named Tav, who cared for me and bravely evacuated me to safety. It was an amazing act of courage on Tav's part, but for them and the others who were out to help, it was just another night of selfless bravery. This is the country that we have now become. Selfless volunteer civilian combat medics are needed to rescue their fellow citizens from the depredations of the federal government. There is one thing that gives me hope, however, and that is the many people from different backgrounds who are raising their voices against this outrage. A shining example for me is Dustin Obermeyer, a giant USNA graduate from the class of 2001, a true combat hero, and former Marine helicopter pilot with three tours into two different war zones. As it turns out, he was standing right next to me when I was struck and gassed by federal officers. It was his first protest also. And he came down with the same question I did. Why are you not honoring your oath to the Constitution? And from that night, the Wall of Vets was born. Now we are working together to add another voice to the call for justice so sorely needed in this country. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my experience and thank you for bringing these issues to light. I have two other things to say that are off my statement. Black lives matter. That's the only reason I'm here. That's the only reason all of vets here are here. Black lives matter. And one last thing, I exist. I'm not fake news. Thank you. Mr. David, thank you for your statement very much. And Professor Snyder, you are now uh granted your five minutes for your statement. Thank you very much, Congressman Raskin, uh, members of the round table, uh, friends from Portland. It's an honor to be with you all. I, I'm, a, I, I'm a professor of history at Yale. I'm also an activist and a protester, um, but I'm here with you in my guise as a historian. 
what I'd like to do with my time is to make three points about how the things that we've heard and the things that we've experienced in Portland fit into what we know from history about how authoritarian regimes arise. I'll be speaking about what I will call the unauthorized and unnamed federal secret police force, which is the best way that I can think of to categorize it. It looks like a secret police, so that's the term that I'm going to use. The three points have to do with the origins of this force, the nature of this force, in particular, how a secret police must always be in contradiction with the rule of law, and the consequences of such a force, in particular with respect to our elections this November. So point number one about the origins. What we know about authoritarian regime change is that it doesn't usually happen overnight. It usually happens because high officials find loopholes in the law. They push the, the mean of the law to its limits and beyond. They seek or create conditions of emergency, which they then exploit. This matches precisely the situation that we're in, where the head of the Department of Homeland Security hasn't been confirmed by the Senate. Um, where the order to carry out violence was exceptionally vague, and where the justification for violence is also very hard to define. The justification, and this is the second troubling thing about the origins of these actions, is based upon an ideology. Um, the fact that this violence is being used to protect monuments is not just incidental. I think it's actually rather central to what's going on. A monument is not a person. And in particular, a Confederate monument or monuments that the president particularly likes tell us a story about a certain kind of innocence in the country. They tell us a story about how it was the white people who were always correct. They tell us a story about how we, the white people, are the innocent ones and the other people have always been on us. They have always been the aggressors. This tendency to replace the real concerns with real human beings with a mythical past has a name, and that name is fascism. When we move away from concern for law and individual rights and toward a story about myth and innocence, which justifies violence, we're moving towards fascism. A second aspect about the origins of this, which is very troubling, is language. If one reads Mr. Trump's fundraising documents or listens to Mr. Trump or Mr. Wolf or Mr. Barr, the basis for these actions sound very much like a conspiracy theory. The idea that there are groups of, I'm using their words, terrorists or anarchists um, is a very troubling notion because these words are precisely the trigger words which have been used throughout the 20th century to signal that some people are outsiders. Some people don't deserve the protection of the rule of law. Some people don't really belong to the nation or the society or the body of citizens. It is all right, in fact, it's required, therefore, that we punish those people. Another feature of this language is that if they are terrorists and anarchists, that means that we are the victims. We're just defending ourselves. The final part of the origins, which is troubling, has to do with the personnel. Historically speaking, secret police forces have very often been drawn from two sources. The first of these is border zones. So for example, in the Spanish Civil War, the troops which ended up being victorious in the far right were troops which have been fighting in a border zone, one of countless examples. In the case of German history, the origins of the SS are as concentration camp guards. Now, these may seem like esoteric examples until we remember that it appears that the men who are carrying out violence in Portland and the men who might carry out violence in the future come precisely from border zones. And if they've been working in our vast network of detention centers, they've also been working in lawless zones. In other words, they come from the places where historically secret police forces come. The dynamic is that men in border zones or men in lawless zones learn exceptional violent behavior, which and then they're turned against everyone. The second basic point I wanted to make has to do with the nature of a secret police force. A secret police force by its nature has to contravene the rule of law. A secret police force is characteristic not of a rule of law state, not of a republic or a democracy, but of an authoritarian or totalitarian state. Why? We've heard about why. Secret police forces break the laws it's known. What happened to Mr. Pettibone is assault and kidnapping. Those are violations of the law. 
What's worse, if possible, is that when the secret police breaks the law, and we saw this in the response of Homeland Security, what will happen is that officials will say, everything we do is legal by definition. And that kind of retrospective justification is what destroys the rule of law. If whatever the secret police do is then excused or defended and described as legal because they did it, then the rule of law ceases to have any meaning. A second feature of the nature of a secret police is its unaccountability, which Mr. Pettibone and Mr. David have already stressed. You don't know how to react to unmarked people. You don't know if they're officers or not. And again, as Mr. David and Mr. Pettibone have both already stressed, these kinds of actions encourage imitation. Um, it doesn't take much to rent a van, put on camouflage, and hurt people. That's an easy idea to have. And in the worst case, what happens is that the government-sponsored secret police and the paramilitaries end up in some kind of open or implicit cooperation. The final thing I want to say about the nature of the secret police that we've seen in this testimony is its unpredictability. It's, uh, it's intolerable not to know who you're confronted with. It's also intolerable not to know when you might be arrested and for what. Unpredictability is the definition of terror. Our, our encounters with law enforcement and with the government in general should be predictable. They should follow rules. The definition of terror is that you don't know if men are going to show up in the middle of the night and take you away. And this is unfortunately very close to what happened in Portland, all too close. In fact, it is what happened in Portland. The third and last point are the consequences. We're, we're in a very particular historical moment now where we have a chief executive who has never exhibited any support for the rule of law or for democracy, where we're in the midst of a terrible economic collapse, and where we're also in the midst of a pandemic which has caused mass death. Um, as others have already mentioned, the images created by violence, the images of provoked violence, have been used in Mr. Trump's electoral propaganda. They've been used in his ads. They've been used in his fundraisers. And the final way, or the most specific way this is alarming, is in connection with his tweet of 30 July, the one in which he called for delaying the elections. Now, sometimes we comfort ourselves by saying he can't do that himself. But of course, no leader can ever do anything by himself. What matters is the response. Those three question marks at the end of that tweet are a call for help. They're an appeal to Americans. What can we do to make a mess of these elections between now and September, now and November? And I'm afraid that we have to consider this new, unaccountable, unnamed federal secret police force as one agent that might respond to that appeal. Again, historically, it's very often the case that authoritarian regimes arise during an election, an election which is messed up. The final point, and here I'd like to echo something that Lou Fredrickson said, uh, the essence of all of this is that racism can't be reconciled with democracy. Racism in the United States most directly affects blacks and people of color. But so long as we have prevalent racism in the country, democracy is also impossible for the rest of us, which is how all of this, I believe, fits together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Schneider, for your excellent statement. Uh, we're going to go right to member questioning at this point, and I'm going to yield first uh, to my distinguished colleague from the District of Columbia, Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton who's recognized for five minutes. Or you may need to unmute. All right. Can you hear me and can you see me? Well, I can hear you, Eleanor. I can, there we go. Now you're fine, <laughs> go right in. Uh, I wanna thank you for this round table. Very much uh, needed. Uh, to probe this incident, which uh, really begins in the nation's capital, which I represent. It, it, it in a real sense, is the epicenter, and it's spread from here to, or, to Portland. Uh, as a result, I have a bill that would uh, make sure that federal officers have body cameras and dashboard cameras. But here, here we're not even talking cameras. We're talking identification. Uh, no, uni no uniforms, no name tags to indicate who these were. And we, we, I have a bill that would say that there have to be 
uh, name tags uh, along with the agency, by, by the way, for federal and local police. So we always know. And you are not speaking. And when you're presenting, make sure that your mic is unmuted and your camera is on. I ask presenters to remember that the public may be listening via telephone. So please state your name before responding to questions. Our first item this morning is an informational briefing on the COVID-19 response. Rachel Banks, you are up. Good morning, Chair Kafori, Commissioners. Uh, for the record, my name is Rachel Banks. I'm your Public Health Director. It's fabulous to um, be with you all again to talk Good about- Good morning. Good morning. Our COVID briefing. Um, today with me, I will have Chris Voss and Kim Taves. Uh, next slide, please, Tasia. So we're gonna be talking today 